Isn't that a cute picture? That's my mother, and she's not watching today. She's down uh, in North Carolina with my sister, who gets to celebrate her first Mother's Day with baby Kyson after, and it's a wonderful, just wonderful day because she lost her first baby um, during childbirth. But that's my baby, Tori. Yeah, she's, yeah, she's here. Uh, <clears throat> but I don't want to slight our other children. But uh, I wanted to say first, uh, be careful what promises you make because last year, I thought we were old enough that you had to start forgetting things. But apparently you remember, you got a mind like a trap because he said to me, you promised last year you would preach Mother's Day. So, and I thought, oh man, I thought he would have forgotten by now. We're old enough now. We're starting to forget things, right? Not that one. He's got a mind like a trap. But anyway, um, but I don't want to slight our other children. Uh, Hannah is in Ohio. She has four lovely, lovely grandchildren. We don't get to see them nearly enough, but she is up there, and uh, she did. We've already texted each other this morning, and she's my bonus daughter. I consider her just, my commitment to her is just as strong as to my natural children, to her and Robbie. Robbie's in Cyprus in, at the Air Force, in the Air Force, but then there's Dustin, who is uh, probably our biggest surprise. Wouldn't you think he's probably, he was mine anyway. We were afraid he would end up in jail. It is not, it is not, I'm not lying. When we had a cat die one time and we had a little funeral. I don't know, you all were at seven. I don't even know. You were really young. And uh, when the funeral was over for Misty, the cat, he yells, well, show's over, and he runs, and he goes, finds, a, he's just, he just had a great time, and we thought, that's it. He has no compassion. <laughs> he was our extreme child. Now, he and Hannah butted heads. They were the oldest because we, did, we are a blended family, but, um, and, and Tori had some run-ins with Rob, but it was great. They, they did get along, and that was part of the, the deal when we got married. They had to get along, but they had their, Robbie broke Tori's nose. <laughs> So this is motherhood to me. And we had fights, but we made, we made it through the blended family. So, that's, uh, so then there's Tori, who's here with us. But Dustin is our little theologian, isn't he? Well, Dustin is, but I mean, Luke does ask hard questions, but Dustin has gone, he went to school of ministry. Let me say these things about your extreme children. They're extreme, God made them for a reason. So the prayer is they get extreme, extreme for the Lord. Don't pray that, don't pray that off of them. Don't pray, oh, Lord, let them settle down. Don't do that. Don't do that. Let them pray. You pray that that extremism gets used for the Lord. And let them be a Paul and let them be a Dustin. Okay? So uh, that's, and then we've got Luke. What more can we say? All right. So um, the, the point of this, why I'm up here, I'm just going to talk to friends. Because I, when I say preaching, that word stumbles on my tongue just um, because it makes me too nervous. It's such an awesome responsibility. So I'm going to give you my testimony. Can I do that? Can I just start with my testimony? Okay, I will. Uh, but uh, before uh, this, actually, the testimony starts back in September. And uh, please, I hope this is the last time we have to talk about it because <laughs> I'm so tired of talking about it. I want to be well and that I want to be my next chapter to start being written. OK, and I, I always want to use it as a testimony, but I want to start a new chapter and it starts today. But before um, we started in September, we went down to Gateway Church as a staff. It was the best. I was looking so forward to it. I told Bob that I'm going to Gateway uh, pastors leaders conference whether you go with me or not I'm headed out I'm going to Texas I'm flying down and sure enough you were gracious enough to say well if you're going babe the whole church is going the whole church staff is going so we were blessed to be able to go down there and um, not knowing what was ahead of me just even started while we were there and I say all that to say, oh, did, do I still have the picture up? Oh, okay. You can go, the, the title of the message today is Book of Ruths. And you can, uh, the reason I have that up there, I'm sorry. My mother's name, middle name is Ruth. And my middle name is Ruth. And Victoria's middle name is Ruth. And my, my grandmother, Tori's great-grandmother, her middle name is Ruth. So it's the Book of Ruths. Okay, so that's the title of today's not message, message testimony. Okay. But anyway, so we're going to get to the book of Ruth in just a little bit and how what a powerful lineage it is to be a part of. And uh, But I wanted to share that picture because it is so pre they are so precious to me. But um, So it started down in September in, at Gateway Conference. And I, um, because I grew up not being able to talk about these things really in mixed company, the issue of blood, okay, um, 
we're, uh, we're just going to call it an issue, okay? Can we do that? Everybody shake your head. We're just going to call it an issue, okay? So when we were down there, that issue started. And, um, it, it, and because of hormones, that kind of thing, it, it, just, it just got fouled up. It just got fouled up. And I was dealing with that while we were there. And then it was fouled up so much, I was dealing with, dealing with that issue all the whole, after we left there too, okay? So, you know, you just kind of keep that stuff to yourself because, like I said, I grew up, you didn't talk about that kind of stuff in mixed company. But so I dealt with that issue. And come uh, October, uh, let's see, 28 days later, 28 days later, um, uh, I was dealing with that again on a, on a much greater scale, and I developed a blood clot. We don't know why. It was, I was two days, I had Patty in the office, we're Googling, don't ever Google, just please don't Google. Uh, you never know what you're going to come across. But my arm was hurting, and I, we couldn't figure out why it was hurting. I hadn't exercised in a funny way. All I know is that I, uh, it, I hadn't, you know, there just was no reason. So we're Googling, and we said, maybe it's a blood clot. You know, it's a rare thing to get a blood clot in your arm. But <clears throat> so it was just two or three days. Next thing I know, we're in the ER with Luke. We think his leg, maybe ankle may be broken. And I said, Bob, you just go ahead and take him out. I'm just going to check. That's crazy, right? And I'm laying there thinking, they're going to tell me, go home, girlfriend. There ain't nothing wrong with you, you know. But sure enough, I was right. Not only did I have one, I had two in my arm. And they put me on a, a medicine that I'm not going to call out because I might want to have a lawsuit one day. But I told the doctor, I said, this is a real concern for me. I'm reading the side effects of this, and I'm afraid of hemorrhaging. And he told me, well, all I can do, Miss Vineyard, is admit you and see how you react to it in the morning. Well, the dosage was low, and so we went on home, didn't we? But when the dosage, that you have to be on such a dosage for so long, and then they raise it. Well, they raised it, and sure enough, I was right. It happened. I was upstairs by myself. It was in the middle of the night. I said, babe, uh, uh, we will not sleep. I had, to, I had to literally go to the restroom every hour to make sure that just things didn't get out of hand. And w when I was there, I felt the lifeblood go out, go out of me. He couldn't hear me. I start stomping. I start yelling for Luke, you know, and he couldn't hear me. The doors are shut. So I start stomping on the floor, hoping he does, and you woke up. And you came up. I said, I got to go to the ER. And um, I just, I thought, this is what the lifeblood, this is what it feels like. And so I've I, I stuck with that. So we go to the ER, and, um, and they admit me, and they said, sure enough, uh, it's, it's, it's a bad situation. So they did what they called an embol embolization, fibroid embol I was I had a huge fibroid that I didn't know was so big. And it, it's so vascular. And that blood feeds it, and that and it, that's how it grows, and that ha that's how it lives, and so they what they want to do is this new procedure is it kills the blood vessels in that fibroid, so it no longer bleeds anymore. Well, it's a very painful procedure, uh, not knowing, and they kept saying, "Oh, it's it's painful, Miss Vineyard." I'm like, "Okay, it's painful, Miss Vineyard. Okay, I got it. It's painful, Miss Vineyard. Okay, I got it. Oh, it's painful." <laughs> I had no idea how painful it would be, but. Um, and because it was so big, what it does is it shoots this chemical. If I'm right, please forgive me, AMA, if I'm wrong. Um, it shoots a chemical in there, and it starts to kill off the um, best blood vessels slowly. So they're dying in there. So what you all might not have known, but some of you did, that I had for that till March a blood a, a fibroid that was dying slowly. And it, was, it would go away. It, the pain would be there, extreme pain. And then it would calm down, and then it would start killing off things again, and then it would come to... So I was in this ebb and flow this whole time of dying, this fibroid dying, and it was a lot of pain. And, uh, but you just keep on trucking. You just do what you got to do. And I came in, and uh, so we decided that the hysterectomy was the way to go. And they had put me on a medicine that was another progesterone, that was another hormone medicine, that the, my one doctor said was great, and the other doctor said, oh, no, you're not going to be on a hormone. You had a blood clot, and that can, that can be causative for it. So we ended up, we had to go that route. Well, that's where the real uh, joy began. And so I, we found a doctor up in um, Reston, Virginia. I say that because it adds to the story. Um, and while I was in there, we were so excited. I had the best, you know, 
testimonies. You're going to feel like a million bucks. Remember, Karen, you shared that with me. Not there yet. I'm at a thousand. I'm at maybe 1,500. I'm getting there to a million. And uh, just people over and over, you're going to feel so great when this is over. So, whoo, yeah, I'm looking forward to this whole thing being over. And I go home, and it, it was. Uh, but while I was in there, interestingly enough, that they found I only had one kidney. And that, I think, is where people stop. They're like, well, how could you have only one kidney? How? And Pastor Jeff says, you better start counting organs if you... <laughs> You better go back, you know, start counting organs. So I think it was interesting that they found I only had one kidney. I had the ureter, but I did not have the other kidney. We think, my sister who was there, who's tremendous, Diane, she helped me out through this, that I was number five in a, in a, a group of six kids, siblings. And they, mom and dad ran out of money, and they just decided they need to sell a kidney. <laughs> they took mine. I got a beef with them. They never told me. But uh, so they had to sell that kidney, but I went in and it was, so they spent an extra hour in there trying to, he said, the doctor said, we had people lined up to see what was going on inside of you. I think that's kind of funny. Ha ha. Um, not, but um, so the, the chance of infection increased anytime, the longer they have to be in there, the longer it is. And so they were in there uh, looking around and just, you know, it, it, they even asked Bob, did you know that? No, we did not know that. So uh, they sent me home without a lot of pain medicine because everybody's team kidney. I got to tell you, that's not cool. When you only have one, you start to resent it because you can't get any help, you know. So it, isn't that sad that you, you start um, resenting the one thing you have because of the one thing you don't? And so there's a lesson there. But um, I think really think that God was protecting me. All these years, I could not take pain medicine. It made me nauseous. Uh, very sick, uh, you know, just, and I know a lot of you are dealing with that, that deal with that too, but I can't take pain medicine. Um, it makes me loopy, but I really think that at some point God was protecting me because I couldn't take pain medicine and I only had one kidney. And it, a lot of stuff gets filtered through that. And so I really think in all that craziness, God was protecting me for that. But anyway, so I went in, uh, and, and they, they found that. So I'll go home, and everything's great. I go home six days. A lot of you were, I, I had so many, y'all were delivering meals and flowers, and it was all wonderful. And then, and Kelly Sakai came by one day, and the next day, it was just like, bam, I started developing a fever, and a, just terrible pain, just really just terrible pain. And it was the day that Bob was supposed to go to the Gambia take off for his mission strip the very day. So what does that tell you? Um, literally, I think literally, you pulled out of the driveway to go to the airport and I pulled out to go to the ER. And <laughs> he devil sneaky that way. Tori took me to the ER and we had a debate. Do we go back to Reston? Do we stay here local? And we went up to Reston because that's where my surgery was. But let me tell you, I, I just want to give this, because some of you may be perplexed. Why would Bob go on to a mission trip when you're headed to the ER? And it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to get you all maybe to understand, but when we were first married, I was not a very good preacher's wife. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> I wasn't. I was jealous. I had all the, you know, I had a lot of that stuff going on, but God made me a promise. And when you get a word from the Lord, uh, I mean, it, I don't say that very often because the word of the Lord is in this book. But he does talk to us. And he said to me very clearly, I was feeling sorry for myself. If you let him do what I've called him to do, I will take care of you. Whew. That was the day our, our marriage changed because that first year was hard. Tori could probably tell you. Our that was hard, but that word has stuck with me for 20 years. And it, it's not easy. We've had several situations where the devil's tried to, to, to drag me down so you don't get to go do your work well. And, and my work, too. I don't want you to think I'm discounting myself in the, in the work of the Lord. Um, but so he was literally taking off, and I said, go, go. I'm going to go. They're going to give me an antibiotic and send me home. I really, really thought that that's what they were going to do. Sure. So um, they didn't. They um, said, we're going to keep you one night, which is where this is kind of funny. The kids, before I took off, they prayed for that surgery. They, they made me a bunch of cards. And I got to tell you, y'all don't know how, how much that meant to me, each one of you. You wrote scriptures in them. You put stickers in them. You, you 
cut them out in funny ways. You just, so much of it said so much. Tyler, you said something that was wonderful in your card. And um, Casey Brown wrote this. This is the very last card I read. Get ready. This is funny. He says, uh, this is from Casey. I hope everything goes as planned and you get better soon. Well, neither of those happened. But <laughs> so when I read that, when I finally read that, I just both, have you ever laughed and cried at the same time? You're just crying through your tears. And I just thought, oh, Lord, if it, it just exactly, uh, exact opposite. So I wanted to thank Casey for writing me that lovely note um, because um, it, it is going as planned. I just didn't know it. And not that the God, that God would ever give me sickness, but he was trying to uh, have something born out of me that I didn't know was there. And so, uh, so we get there, and we, they admit me, and uh, I have got no tolerance to pain. I mean, they tell me I have a high tolerance to pain, but I can't take pain meds. And so they give me a kidney stent, so I go in for another procedure, so back under anesthesia. By the way, my hair is very brittle. Uh, I was very sad when I went to the hairdresser, and, and I and I should have got a color instead of a bleach because it is dry. And um, but anyway, uh, so thank you, kidney stent surgery. And so they put that in and a catheter, right? And I think that's what they did. And so I was, uh, um, it, the uh, it was just anyway. So there, and so I, I'm in there, and um, but I, my fever's not coming down. They can't figure out why my fever's not coming down. But they're giving me. Uh, more antibiotics, very heavy, pain, uh, very strong antibiotics. And uh, I'm developing thrush at this point. I, you know, this, I don't know if you've ever known that to an adult to get thrush on their tongue. Everything's cardboard. It's nasty. And they give you nasty medicine on top of it. So I didn't eat. So I know Bob was worried that I'd kept losing so much weight, but the fact was I couldn't eat. If you don't eat, you lose weight. That's the diet, that's the diet plan. I'm just telling you, that's the secret diet plan. If you don't eat, you lose weight. And um, so I couldn't eat. I just, that thrush was so bad in my mouth. And, and it was bad. And Bob was gone. I wasn't angry at him. But, and as I told Pastor Jeff, and you all couldn't, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't praise the Lord. I knew he loved me. And I knew he'd see me through it. But I could not praise him. I sat there um, with the YouTube, the phone at my, just to even get some sleep, the pain was just really hard. And I would listen to healing scriptures. Now, I know it was doing more than just comforting me to sleep. But it was, I remember hiding my head under the blanket thinking, I can't even make a decision right now because I'm in so much pain. And we didn't tell you all because we didn't want you to worry. That's what a good mother does. Now, you might, as children might think, why don't you tell us anything? Because we don't want you to worry. That's it. That's all in a nutshell. We don't want you to worry when we don't tell you things. But Pastor Chris was great. I remember hearing him say, listen, they keep telling her one more day. And they did. They did keep telling me just one more day. We need to keep you one more day. So after they did the kidney stent, the surgery wasn't, I was still having a lot of pain. And I had a great nurse. Thank you, nurses around the world. Thank you, nurses. Are you a nurse or a teacher? Raise your hand in here if you would for me. Are you a nurse? Nurse, nurse's aide, any kind of medical. You are... God bless you. I had one nurse listen to me when the doctors wouldn't. And she said, ah, let's go get you an ultrasound because they wanted to do a CT scan. And I'll get to my message in a minute. Um, but um, she wanted to do a CT. She said, let's do an ultrasound, so a sonogram, so they know what, what this is going on. Maybe there's something else going on in there. And before, because CT scans are like thousands and thousands of thousands of dollars. And they went in, and they said, um, you ever had any gallbladder issues? Now, I have thrown up all of my life. I know that's, not a, nasty, that's a nasty term, but it's just something I've gotten accustomed to. Uh, Bob said you can throw up at anything, and I could. Didn't know what was really going on was the gallbladder was not a happy gallbladder. It just didn't work. I had two issues. I had sludge and stones, and it didn't work. It didn't milk. It's, there's a big fancy dis something word for it, two word for it. And it just didn't work. So I was experiencing a lot of pain from that. Plus, there was an abscess growing um, in underneath my ovary. Now, they couldn't see that. So the doctor sat down with me, and he said, Miss Vineyard, if you were in front of me, I, you, know, you can leave your gallbladder in, or we can go ahead and take it out. And I said, at the end of the day, I've got to get out of the, underneath this pain. So they did the, um, but I said, no, when you go in there, because of the, f the pain in the area it was in, I said, if it's my appendix too, 
brother, take it out. You got my permission. I don't have to sign anything. You see it? Take it. Get, we're good to go. And it turns out, and he went in there, and he would not have saw, done that had I not told him, because you got to go into a whole different section. And he went in there, and he said, your appendix looked great, but I moved it, and there was an abscess underneath. They couldn't see it before, and they could see it. So... Um, so they knew then, and he, they took the biopsy. They tried to clean it out, and they took the biopsy. Not the biopsy, but they drained it. And so they sent off the uh, stuff to get it analyzed. It turns out I had six uh, bacteria in there that were not supposed to be. Two that were rare. One the doctor had never seen, my hospital doctor. So there was a lot going in and going in, on in there um, that was deadly, ugly. He said, 50 years ago, you would have been in a pickle, he told me. You'd have been in a mess if I had 50 years ago. So um, those are great words to hear. But thank God for doctors. Thank God for medicine. I believe God heals through those means as well as uh, supernaturally. But so what a great lesson. It could have been, they didn't know, could it have been from the extra hour they spent in there for the kidney? Could it have been the, the leaky gallbladder or the gallbladder that wasn't working and, the, and that going down there? Could it have been the dying fibroid? Well, I'll never know unless God chooses to reveal it to me one day. I'll never know. But what I do know is just like that hidden abscess sin in our life is, I didn't really know it was there, but I know it was causing me pain. I didn't know how to treat it but the doctors did. They went looking. So I want you to save that little nugget for later. So they, um, so they, they get that all, they get that all fixed up. And they, and I had an IV blown. There's a whole lot more to the story. I had an IV, so they had to put a midline in me. And I, I, but each day they would say, one more day, Miss Vineyard, one more day. We want to because the antibiotics had been so strong. The bacteria in the um, sample was um, slow growing. So that's really one of the reasons I had to stay so long in there. They wanted to see what the bacteria was so they knew they were treating it correctly. But they, um, the breaking point for me, and this is kind of, this is kind of summing this testimony part up, was, um, and, and you came home, you were home, and um, the nurse comes in and says, and the doctor says, well, we're going to let release you today. We'll probably put you on uh, some, um, the, the uh, infectious disease doctor will probably put you on an oral Antibiotic, we grow. Woo! It's time to celebrate. I'm finally feeling good. And um, then the nurse comes in. It wasn't very long later, and she said, "The doctor wants to do a pick line in your arm." And that's when I, I had been holding it together, hadn't I? Just being a nurse. And you know that they t keep track of you if you're a mean or a nice patient. <laughs> I think that's funny. I didn't know that that they write it in your notes if you're a mean or a nice patient, because all the nurses came. Oh, you're so nice. Your notes. You know, they 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 told me that things that were said about me, and that was that was the testimony to the Lord. Because I guess your joy shines. His joy shines through when you you don't feel like it. And so, um, I argued with them a little bit, but I'm a team player. And they took me down. You had to go down to radiology <clears throat> to do this. And I'm on this metal slab. And they, you know, I had to move from one table. And remember, I can't take my, I, I, they give me a Tylenol. And that was about all I could have, one. <laughs> and um, I'm still in a lot of pain from two surgeries, uh, three uh, procedures at this point. Because they did take my gallbladder out. I forgot to tell you oh, that part. They did take my gallbladder out. And they say, move over to the table, and you're like, what? Move over, to the, move over, you know, get from this table. This is a metal slab, and um, I've got my arm out to change the midline IV to a pick line, and I'm arguing with them, and the reason why is because, remember, I had the blood clot in my arm, and pick lines can cause blood clots. So I, I had one in this arm, and now I'm ready. I'm worried that this arm will develop one. So I'm literally, I had not really asked the Lord why until that moment. And it was like a scream in my head. And if I could have screamed out loud, I would have. And the nurses probably would have jumped for fear. But it was the why moment, Lord, am I going through this? I don't understand. 
at that moment, at, uh, literally, I am not kidding you. I hear the phone ring in the um, radiology. The infectious disease doctor had met up with Bob, who had ordered the pick line for whatever reason. I don't, I, I, I don't know other than I know the Lord heard my cry. <laughs> and he had a come to Jesus meeting with the infectious disease doctor. And the minute they were getting ready to change that midline to a, a pick line, they, he said, hold the phone, stop the show. And they decided to let me go home with a midline instead. And I want to thank you for that, but I thank the Lord. And because I just didn't want to go through any more fear of being on that blood thinner. If you're on blood thinner, please do not take my testimony as a reason to get off blood thinner. It was just something um, that I had gone through, and it just left a bad haunting that's, that's what it was. It was a haunting from that. So anyway, um, I go home with the midline, and they have to do infusions every day. But you were so great. You were just, you, you should have raised your hand when they said, I asked for a nurse, because you were the greatest nurse I could have had. You gave my IVs, you know, every day. He was so sweet and tender through it, which is not usually his, gen his, his usual manner. So... I do have to be nice to him. Um, anyway, so I came on with this and they, when we were doing that and, and the pain subsided and it got, um, it got better and better and better. And Friday, just a few days ago, I, got, I had my blood work drawn and I am completely infection free. So there's the testimony. That was one page. <laughs> um, so that was one page of my notes. No, I will get through this. I promise. That was the longest part of what I had to say. But um, so here we are today. I'm, I do, I'm still tender. I still move slow. Um, I can't drive for long distances. Kathleen Genera will not let me lift anything high, heavier than a feather. And I thank my sisters for fussing at me. Um, that's what we're here for, right? We're here to fuss at each other when we need it. And she told me to put that chair down. Um, and I couldn't lift anything heavy yesterday. So, um, but anyway, so that's my testimony. And remember, we went back, started in September, we were at Gateway. And part of what we were doing at Gateway was, was learning how to be a better team, learning how to do uh, things better in the church ministry, learning how to be better pastors and leaders. And it, some of you know my passion is to do uh, is to do skits like these little mini skits. I don't do long plays; it's too overwhelming. But I can give you a two-minute skit, hands down, um, in no time. And I know Gabby uh, Sakai feels the same way as I do. She's a lot of fun too. But um, anyway, that was that's my heart. If the only thing I enjoy doing in the office is the bulletin. And some of y'all want to get rid of that. I think I'd get, <laughs> I'd have to quit my job. So Chris and I, we're not getting rid of the bulletins. Because um, I love to be creative in that, man, in that sense. And um, if, if I could tell the elders, listen, hire me to do this. Don't, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a lousy secretary. And I've never been, a, I could never be convicted by a jury for being organized. I know I look like I'm organized, but I am not going to my office, look at my desk. I am the least organized person probably on the staff. And, but when it comes time to bringing it all together, at the end, I'm there. And so September, this is, this is kind of what's just stirring in my heart to be able to do more of and more of and more of. And bam, he hits you right on the, when you're ready to go exit out the door and hit the new, hit a new place, he hits you just smack in the face, doesn't he, Pastor Jeff? He does. And that's what I felt like besides hindering Pastor Bob he was trying to hinder my ministry as well. I don't know where we'll, I don't know that I'll ever get to where I want to go, but that's where it's, well, it's in my heart to do is, is a drama ministry. So as we're doing that, I want you to, if you would throw up, uh, and if you've got your Bibles, you can read um, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2. We're going to spend a little bit of time, just a few minutes in 1 Corinthians and then in the book of Ruth, because remember the message is the book of Ruth's. Are we there? Oh, 1 Corinthians one, uh, 2, 1 and 2. Did I tell you that? Okay. That's okay. Uh, no, that's okay. I can read it to you. You might have gotten it in your, uh, opened up your Bible. First, uh, is it 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2? Yeah. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians. Wait a minute. 2, 1 and 2. 
Yeah, verses 1 and 2. If I'm wrong, you look it up <laughs> later. And when I came to you, this is Paul. And in first, and, and, and maybe it is 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry. Please forgive me if I typed this out wrong. Okay, just read it, he says. Um, Paul, in 1 Corinthians, he's had to fuss at the church because they've had some, th some things going on in the church that were not cool, were seriously, seriously not cool. And so he had to fuss at them. That's my mother's southern saying. Fussing at you means she gave you a good chewing out. Uh, if I fuss at you, it means you got a good chewing out. But he had to fuss at them. And in, se in, this, sec in this second letter to the Corinthians, he's kind of explaining his ministry, where he's been, where he, what, what's kept him from them, and what's been good, uh, and what's been going on with him. And he's just trying to explain that. And so I think a lot of this is where my testimony lands. And when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I got no lofty speech. And my little wisdom is little. But, uh, um, but I, am I have decided, I am determined, in one, uh, one version says, I am resolved, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ with him crucified. Now, what I go through and what Paul went through are very different things, but they were in them. They were serious burdens uh, uh, by themselves. Um, I did not go through what he went through, but I went through my own trials. And what I really want this church to understand is everything we do is for, is to edify you all and to lift Jesus up, and that I we don't want anything to be known among you except Jesus Christ and his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Everything we do is ultimately to lead to somebody's salvation. What are we in the business for? And I don't want to call it a business. What are we doing if we're not doing that? Everything, every time we eat, every time we play a game, every time we get together, every time Pastor Bob or Chris or Jeff or Gary preaches, every time it's so somebody has the opportunity to hear the gospel and be saved. And Paul is saying, I don't want anybody to know anything among you or me except Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection. And so what I went through the devil tried to bring me down, but God knew he was, I was going to use it for good one day. Six months later, but one day, right? And so I, I'm determined. I want that word I've decided, determined, I want that to stay in your head because it's a very important uh, point in, in the book of Ruth. So 2 Corinthians 1, 3, we're going to go through 12 if you will turn to that for sure, 2 Corinthians and why, why I know that this is uh, confirmed, I had two confirmations. Tamara Dalton um, said to me, as I'm reading this scripture, I really hadn't gotten back into the word. It was the first time laid, God laid 2 Corinthians on my heart. I don't know why, but he did. And I just, kept, I just kept hearing it. So I got in there. When God keeps telling you a, a book to get into, a verse to get into, you get into it. Don't, don't hesitate. Be obedient. And so I, I opened up the book. Now, Pastor Jeff, I think, was the first person I told. Because, Pastor Jeff, I think you went through something very similar. And I know Gary Williams on the other side of the camera who's watching. Um, Jewel. We like to think that there's a blessing beyond measure. And there is. If you're a, if you're a believer, there's a blessing beyond measure. But let me tell you, if you're a disciple and you're a leader... There's sometimes a burden beyond measure. The key verse is eight. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure. And when I read that, I just broke and I just cried and I cried and I cried and I cried some more and Tamara Dalton, at that very moment, sent me a text and said, I can't wait to hear your testimony. So that was part of the confirmation that I was supposed to give it. And Diane um, Golding said, all I'm hearing is shut the door. God had given you a word. You didn't know of the four or five messages I've ever shared. One of them was shut the door. So it was confirmation. And not the message itself, but the fact that it was I had something titled that once before. 
So what was Paul's burden beyond measure? If you go a little farther in 2 Corinthians, and I'm not going to make, make you turn there, five times he was beaten, 39 times, beaten with rods three times, stoned once, shipwrecked three times, a night and a day he uh, spent in the deep, journeyings often, perils of water, perils of robbers, perils by mine own countrymen, your own peeps, perils by the, uh, by the heathen, those are your, your, those are your uh, enemies, Perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren. Weariness, painfulness, watchings often, hunger, thirst, fastings, cold and naked, daily the care of all the churches, daily. Fear of arrest, but let down through a basket in a, in a window in a wall and escaped. I thought that was very funny that he closes that with, listen, I got out by a basket. And so did Moses. But let me tell you, the day that... Uh, I wanted to come back the first time I got to come to church. Pastor Jeff texted me, said, are you going to be there Sunday? And I said, if I have to come down through the wall or through the hole in the ceiling, my friends will bring me there. And brother, that was another confirmation that I'd be bringing a word. And so those were the, those were the things that Paul did. So what I went through really didn't measure what he went through, but he was burdened beyond measure, and I felt very burdened beyond measure. And we can go ahead and keep reading. Um, uh, let me start with three, verse three. Blessed be the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for the consolation and salvation. And our hope is for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of sufferings, so also you will be partakers of consolation. Now, I want you to know that every time you brought a, a, a meal to me or every time you prayed or any time you encouraged, you yourselves, as you uh, were comforting me, one day I'm going to be comforting you. And it's a teamwork thing. We don't go through anything to get uh, by ourselves. We are not an island. So as you are comforting me, uh, I, I will soon be comforting you. And as I comfort you, you will be comforting somebody else. I'll tell you part of the greatest comfort I had. Is Jewel here today? Is Jewel? Jewel. One of the greatest comforters and encouragers in this church to me has been Jewel. I didn't tell you that while I was going through uh, that issue, they decided I needed some biopsies and I had to sit and wait for an endometrial biopsy and a breast biopsy because they, they did see something on the, and I had to wait. And you were the greatest encouragement to me during that time. And Gary Williams, I'm telling you, if I, oh my goodness gracious, listen, I heard the song the other day and I thought, that's Gary. There is something better than going to heaven. Do you know what it is? Taking someone with you. And I know that's Gary Williams on the other side of that. He's watching. What a great encouragement. So we don't go through anything together. And Paul is saying, I've gone through all these situations, but, it, but it's for your good that I had to go through these things. I hate to say it, but that makes me a little mad at you all. I'm sorry, but it does. Not really. Y'all know me better than that. But... Um, Partakers of the sufferings, you will be partakers of the consolation. Can we, can we read, uh, I already read 8 to you. Can we start at 9? Do you have it? 9 through uh, 12. 1, 9 through 12. I'll just read it right here. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to, uh, to uh, is that right? Uh, no, sorry, 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 sorry. It's up there? Okay. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who what? Who delivered us from such a great 
death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that the thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. And I, uh, let me read verse uh, 12. Forgive me. Well, we're just going to stop right there. But death is a part of life. And once you faced it, I had a good friend say, once you faced it, you can do a lot of things, a lot of things. Getting up here and sharing a testimony or a sermon, um, I, I, don't want, I don't want to be afraid anymore. I want to do that drama ministry because it's going to affect you all. It's going to help you all. But the bigger reason for death, and nobody likes to think about it, but how do we prove to the world, we serve a living Savior without the death on the cross. And that one day, one day, we're going to be resurrected with him. That is part of Paul's message. We will be, we will be resurrected with him. It, it will be proof to the world that we serve a living Savior. And it's just, it's just, I want you to know if you've not made a decision to follow Jesus right now, before we leave here, please settle that in your heart because you're going to have to decide before this side of eternity whether or not you're, where you're going to spend it. So I want you to know that, that is, that's part of the testimony. Can we turn to Ruth? I've just got a few more minutes. The book of Ruth. Now, the part of this is Naomi is, uh, she and her husband leave uh, the land of milk and honey. If some of you all don't know about the book of Ruth, uh, her, uh, this woman, Naomi, leaves, and she go, they go to the land of Moab, and they live there. Things get bad. She has two sons. They marry, uh, her husband dies, um, and uh, they marry two women, of, of, of Moabite women, and which are not, uh, the Moabites are not known to be godly people. And so, there's her, uh, then their husbands died, and so Naomi is left with her two daughters-in-law, okay? And, uh, I, I, you know, I hope you have a good mother-in-law. Bob's got the best mother-in-law in the world, I'm just saying. He does have the best mother-in-law in the world. They never call. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> kidding, Mom. I know you call. And she wants to talk about three things. This is what's the book of Ruth's. Um... And not just Ruth. I have, honest to goodness, used to think my mother was crazy. She would say, cover up your TV. Now, this is, this is 30 years ago. Cover up the TV they're watching. They could be watching. She was right. They are watching and listening to everything we do. She just was ahead of her time. So God gave her a word when I thought she, we thought she was crazy. Now she's just the wisest woman I know. Anyway, that we'd like to joke with her about that. Um, but um, so there is no better thing that we as on this Mother's Day can do for our spiritual children and our natural children as to lead them to Christ. So I want to read uh, Ruth, just a little bit out of Ruth 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. That's point number one. That the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. They were returning back to um, go because they, they were hungry. They didn't, this, this lady and her two daughters-in-law, they had to find something to do. She had influence uh, before, so she thought, listen, they're, they're, uh, the Lord's given these people bread. We're going to head back. And she had her uh, one daughter-in-law who decided, mm, sounds good, but uh, no, bye, see ya. She decided not to follow. I mean, they argued with her a little bit, but it, it didn't take much convincing for her to stay. But then Ruth, come, Ruth says, we're going to just jump down to um, 13. No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And so because of the death in her life, she figures the Lord has, 
has kind of exited and he's not listening to her anymore. He's not blessing her anymore. And he, he's just away from her. He's far away from her. So he's, she's trying to convince her daughters-in-law not to go with him. But she said in four, verse 14, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her. One said, bye-bye, and one stayed. And she, 15, and she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and, her, and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For whatever, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And let's first jump down to 18. When she saw that, when Naomi saw that she was, what was that? What's the word? determined. Do you remember I told you earlier, determined to go with her? She stopped speaking to her. Ruth was determined to go. Nothing, nothing Naomi, Naomi tried to paint an ugly picture, but when you hear that there is bread somewhere, you're going to want to go. Let me tell you, there is spiritual bread and there is earthly bread. Uh, Wonder is a pretty good bread. Gluten-free bread is not very good. But spiritual bread, that you can, that you can follow after. And there's so, Ruth, uh, there, I am determined to go with you because where you go, there will be bread. And on this day of days, that the earth, that the world has decided to label Mother's Day. What a painful day. I just got to tell you, and we'll stop right here and say, Golly, i got to hurry up. We should have a part two. Um, the devil is so mean. He takes what is so beautiful, a motherhood, that he created in the very beginning. And he decides, I'm going to mess with them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create miscarriage. I'm going to create infertility. I'm going to create death. There is so much that the devil wants to mess with whenever God gives us something good. But let me tell you something. That whether you have uh, gone through any of that, and I've gone through both infertility and miscarriages, and I know the pain of, of wanting something so bad and not being able to put your hand on it. And I, I, I look out here, and nothing is uncommon to you all. Uh, we, you know... It, I asked Jeff to sing that song, um, uh, Yes, Lord, Yes, Lord. I mean, I told him that was one of my favorite because we are pressed, but we are not uh, persecuted. And I'm, uh, let's, let's just go right there right, real quick. That, that was back in 2 Corinthians, if your finger was there. Uh, I'm just going to read it to you real quick. If I can find it. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in uh, despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body of the, uh, the dying of our Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Can I just give you a little bit of what the message says? What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trial and tortures, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you you are getting in on the best. That is what the life of Jesus is in a believer. If you have a, the common earthen vessel, which we are all, we all walk along. I don't care what woman is in here. She's gone through the thought of a of breast cancer. She's gone through the thought of uh, of, of of bad uh, issues every month. She's gone. You've gone through that. You might have gone through. No, I couldn't have children. There is nothing. Uh, we. It's all common. It's common to believers. It's common to unbelievers. All that stuff is the same to all women. We go through it all the same. We worry about our, our parents. We worry about our children. We worry about our co-workers. We worry about all that stuff. But the difference between what Paul is saying in these earthen vessels, common, it's made out of clay. That's earth. That's common. So what is different is it's the treasure that's inside of us. The treasure of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And the difference between what we have to go through and what the earth goes through is we are pressed but not 
crushed. We are. Let, let's get it out here. I want you all to understand we are, are perplexed, but not in despair. Say it again. Not in? We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. Say it. We are not? That's right. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. We are not what? We are not destroyed. We are none of those things because of what Jesus Christ is in us, that, that what is greater is, that is in us is greater than is in the world, and that these earthen vessels that is common, that what is greater in us has got to shine through. And that's what he's saying, that the, what's the Jesus is in us that is, gets to live, it's going to shine through, and that's what makes us different than unbelievers, that we will stand in the day, and we will see redemption, and we still will see resurrection. Let me hear you say it. We will see resurrection. You will see resurrection. And Ruth was determined that she was going to get to go with Naomi. I could have been Naomi. Sometimes I've wondered if I was torn between being Naomi and Ruth. I felt like I was empty. I felt like I was maybe just a little bit abandoned. I felt like maybe I was all, all alone and being up there and resting, I didn't get many visitors. It was good because I looked really terrible. Hope tried to wash my hair. I think it ended up worse. 12 days, couldn't wash my, I've washed my hair like twice. Woo, y'all don't even see me without my makeup. Can you imagine seeing me without my hair being washed? It was a bad, ugly scene. But I, I knew what, that what was inside of me was greater than what was on the outside of me. And I want the devil to know that today it's all women. God created all women to understand that we may have the common, most common problems together. We have the greatest Savior that's within us. And I felt like Naomi at many times, but my mama called me Ruth. And mom, you, call, you were called Ruth. Guess what? You got coming. Watch out. And her mother before her, because my mother was probably the greatest influence on what a, belie a beautiful, joyous believer looks like. I was empty, but yet I was determined. I had to go from being Naomi at a moment to being Ruth. We got to be determined. We got to be determined that there is bread. If you are hungry, if you're here and the devil has messed with your Mother's Day, it's a day. It's a day. It's just a day. You've missed my birthdays. You've, have you missed, ever missed an anniversary being gone for the Lord? I don't know. You probably have. I, I don't get caught up in days anymore. Yeah, 20, 20 years of days. We've probably both messed up. But it's just a day. Can I let you get rid of the guilt? If you're not with your children today or the sadness, it's just a day. But we celebrate the God who created life. That's worth celebrating. So I don't want you to leave out of here feeling like Naomi and you're empty and the Lord has gone out from you. I want you to leave out of here like Ruth and be determined. Because if you don't know it, Ruth was the 29th grandmother grandmother, 29th power to the power of Jesus' grandmother. What is, how do you say that? I don't know. But anyway, she was Jesus' 29th great-grandmother or something like that. And she was a Moabite. But he was in her lineage. I don't care what you call yourself today. Jesus is here. If you're empty and you don't have bread, you feel like, oh, Lord, I'm, in, I'm just starving. He's got bread for you. And if, you're, and if you want to become Ruth, be determined to follow. Because what did we say at the beginning of all this? And I never got back to my, this little nugget, sin. You can be Ruth and be the 29th power of something to the something of somebody, if the Lord tarries, and lead a whole revolution of Jesus Christ to somebody, your family. If that's you for the first time, if you're the first person in your family, God bless you, more power to you, because you can be a Ruth. And if you're Naomi, it's not too late to find the bread. This, the the um, abscess that was in my stomach, it took a long time for that antibiotic to kick in and work. Sanctification takes a long time. Salvation doesn't. Um, 
So if Pastor Jeff can come out and start playing. I know he's waiting in the wings. He's waiting in the wings to start playing. I want you to close your eyes right now as we get ready to close this out. Sin is an ugly thing. Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for the sin of the whole world. I don't care what you've been through, what you've done. It doesn't matter to me. It really doesn't. If you're in, in, under the sound of my voice right now. And uh, sometimes, sometimes it takes a little while to work all that stuff out. But salvation can be in a moment. And, and the uh, scripture says that when one sinner repents, the angels rejoice. Sin isn't always about salvation. It can be that you open doors in your life. I, we don't remember, we don't know what caused that abscess. Maybe you've got an open door in your life. Maybe you're saved and you've opened a door to sin in your, uh, to infection in your life. And it may take a while for the, the blood of Jesus. I mean, it can be instant, but we go from glory to glory, from glory to glory, the scripture says. So maybe there's somebody here who has not truly repented and said, I want to make him Lord of my life. And if you're a believer and you've, you've, you feel like God's gone away from you, he hasn't. It just means you, you, you just need to find your way back to him. He's right where he is, always is. Jesus loves you. So that's my call to you today. This beautiful celebrating all women day, Mother's Day, that um, you just check your heart. Where is it? is it? Is there an infection going on that you don't know about that's causing things not to go right in your life? Or if there is that you know about it, you ask the Lord, Holy Spirit, and He will help you through it. You just, re you just submit it to the Lord. You repent, and you submit it to the Lord. If you all would stand... If everyone would just close their, close their eyes right now. Because if I am not, if we are not here, that everything ultimately ends up in salvation. Where you're going to spend your next uh, part of your life, your, your eternity life. Nobody's watching. But you raise your hand. If you, you don't, you're not sure if you're saved or if, you know, you, you would like to talk to one of us about save, salvation. Would you raise your hand? Yes, Miss Morrell. You come up here for prayer? Okay. Okay. So we're going to be praying for your sister. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. They cannot do nothing. We do know that, yes. We're going to pray for Morrell's sister. She is up here on, she is standing in the gap for her sister who has cancer all over, and there's nothing they can do for her. But we know that the Lord of glory can do something for her and through her through this. And we know that the resurrection, once you've placed your life in the hands of Jesus Christ, and you understand that it's not just a, uh, not being a fan, but it's being a disciple, that uh, there is power in the resurrection. And one day, that's the hope that we will see again our loved ones. So as we pray, if, uh, we're just going to, uh, Pastor Jeff, if you go ahead and start. If you want to come up here and have prayer, if this is a hard day for you, uh, if, if your mother has caused you pain, how about you do her a favor and forgive her, just like Jesus forgave us. If you're not with your mother today, maybe she's passed on and, you, and she's gone on to glory and you miss her. Think of the good times. Don't think that she's gone. I want you to remember the good times. Mm. If she's still here with you on earth, give her a call. She's waiting after you get out of church. Don't use your phones right now. She's waiting for you to call her. I called my, my mama already. And if you, if, she, if you are a spiritual mother or if you have a spiritual mother, Charlene Parker has been my spirit. She never gave birth to a natural child, but she, is, she doesn't have anybody closer or more, more committed to her as a daughter as I am to her. Charlene Parker, she's my spiritual mother. And I give honor to my mother, Ruth Webb. He raised me to be a follower of Jesus Christ. 
So if you want prayer today for anything, come on up front as we sing this song.